thumbs up. So he says we're good to go. Let's open our Bibles together at this time to the book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse 16 for our message from God's Word this morning. Romans 8, 16 will be located on page 1201 if you're using the church Bible this morning. This morning being September 29th, 2024. Our text is going to begin in Romans 8.16 and go on down through verse 22. And the title of this morning's message is Why Does God Allow Pain and Suffering? Why does God allow pain and suffering? And we begin with the story of a man who called a politician one day and asked him do you ever suffer from sharp pains all over your body? Like somebody had a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing you over and over again with it. And the politician said, no, I don't. And after a few seconds, the man said, how about now? And he was <laughs> dabbing him over and over again. Next, I have some medical advice for you. If you suffer from joint pain, it's probably because you're holding the wrong end of the joint. <laughs> the end that's out of fire. Well, we've had some fun with our title, as we always do. But it is a serious subject. And speaking of pain and suffering, the question of why a loving God allows people to suffer pain and disease and afflictions that's a question that Paul is about to answer here in Romans chapter 8. That is, if you're a believer, if you're not saved, if you're not a believer, the answer to that question is a simple one. God allows pain and suffering in your life to get you to look into how to get to heaven where there will be no more pain and suffering. But if you're a believer, there are some things that the Apostle Paul wants you to know about the sufferings of life. Beginning in verse 60, where we read these words. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The first thing that Paul wants you to know about pain and suffering is that experiencing it doesn't mean you're not a child of God. And he starts this passage that way because he knows that the first thing that Christians wonder about when they're enduring pain and suffering is that. They ask themselves, if I'm really a child of God, why is he letting me go through this? And to address that concern, Paul says that the Spirit itself bears witness that believers 
are the children of God. But before we talk more about that, you might be wondering why Paul calls the Holy Spirit of God an it in that verse. Because if you paid attention in English class when you were in school, you know that the proper pronoun for a male person, like the Holy Spirit, is himself, not itself. And that's why most of the, the newer versions of the Bible have, have changed that verse to make it read that way. But the reason our King James translators translated it itself has to do with how the Spirit bears witness that we're the children of God. You see, he doesn't do it out loud. If you're hearing voices, it's probably because Siri thought you asked her something. <laughs> or you're at home and Alexa's reminding you of an appointment you had that day. The Spirit bears witness that you're a child of God in the Bible, in the book that he wrote. And unlike the spirit, a book isn't it, not a hymn. So itself is the correct translation here. The spirit of God wrote the words of the Bible through the men who wrote it. So whenever you read the Bible, the spirit bears witness with your spirit that the things the Bible says are true. That's why it doesn't say the Spirit bears witness to your spirit, like it would if he spoke out loud. What does it say? It says he bears witness with our spirit. He's with us while we're reading the scripture. See the difference? And your spirit is part of the trinity that makes up who you are. God created man, he said in your first reference, in Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, all of the air, the cattle and over all the earth. God the Father said to God the Son and God the Spirit, let's make man in our image. And part of what he meant by that is, let's make man a trinity like us. And now, in your next reference, you're made up of what 1 Thessalonians 5.23 calls spirit and soul and body. So what's the difference between those three? Well, you use your body to relate to the world physically. You hug people here on Sunday morning, or handle things at home, like the remote control for the TV. If you're a man, I mean, that's our domain, right guys? <laughs> but you use your soul you use your soul to relate to the world emotionally. The Bible often says to do what it says in Deuteronomy 6.5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. And oftentimes in the Bible you read things like you see in your next reference. In Psalm 11.5 where David said, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked his soul hated. And then he said in Psalm 35, 9, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. And love and hate and joy, they're all emotions that you feel in your soul. 
But your spirit, your spirit is the part of you that relates to the world intellectually. As you see when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. So when you crack open your Bible and in your next reference it says in Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When you read that, the Spirit's words there bear witness with the intellect of your spirit that you're a child of God. Because you put your faith in Christ's death for your sins. And, verse 17 of our text says, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. If you're a child of God this morning, you are an heir of God Almighty. And the thing that you inherit is the thing that Paul talked about in Titus 3, 5 and 7. According to his mercy, he saved us, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If you're a child of God by grace, then you're an heir of eternal life. And that beats anything that billionaires like Elon Musk and Bill Gates can give you if you were a child of one of them. But verse 17 says that we're not only heirs of God and eternal life by grace, we're also joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with Christ. So the answer to the question of why God allows Christians to suffer in life is that suffering allows us to inherit something jointly with Christ. And the dictionary says that word joint there means something that's shared by two or more people like a joint checking account. But now, don't be confused by this verse, because we all suffered with Christ when we got saved. What did we learn back in Romans 6.3, your next reference? So many of us, as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. When you put your faith in Christ's death for your sins, the Spirit took you back to Calvary and identified you with Christ in the suffering that he suffered on the cross. But in verse 17, Paul doesn't say we're joint heirs with Christ if we suffered past tense with Christ, does it? He says we're joint heirs with Christ if we suffer with the present tense. With what, well, peek ahead to verse 18, with what 18 calls the sufferings of this present time makes you a joint heir with Christ. And the kind of suffering that he's talking about is the kind that he talks about in the rest of this passage, the kind that even animal creatures can suffer. The suffering of physical pain. And when Christians suffer pain, we suffer it with Christ. Because you see, he didn't just suffer pain on the cross. If he fell down on the playground when he was a boy, his body would hurt. 
was helping his father in the carpentry shop and hit his thumb with the hammer, his thumb would hurt. He'd feel pain, just like he did on the cross. He wouldn't have been human otherwise, folks. And don't forget, he had to be human to die for humans. So when we suffer pain like that, we suffer it with him. Because he suffered it too. And verse 17 says that that makes us all joint heirs with Christ. And we don't have to guess as to what we inherit with Christ. Because Paul says we're joint heirs with him that we may be glorified together with him. All believers are going to inherit glory with Christ as well as eternal life. That explains why Ephesians 1.18 says the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's talking about the same thing Paul's talking about here. If we're joint heirs with Christ, then the glory of his inheritance isn't just going to be found in him someday. It'll also be found in us. Now, there's different kinds of glory in the Bible. But the kind Paul's talking about here is the same kind Matthew 19, 28 talks about when it says, the Son of Man will sit in the throne of his glory. And that's the same kind of glory that Hebrews 2, 9 talks about when it says we see Jesus crowned with glory. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you, throne and crowns all have to do with reigning, like, like a ruler reigns over people. And that's the kind of glory that we're going to inherit with Christ. As Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verses 10 and 12, where he says, I endure all things for the election that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. And we all suffer pain with Christ. So we're all going to reign with Christ. Now, if it seems odd to you that the Lord plans to reward you with glory for suffering pain and afflictions, don't forget, you live in a dispensation where God is not shielding you from diseases like he did the Jews under the law if they obeyed him. And you also don't live in the dispensation when the Lord was here on earth healing his people of pains and afflictions. So he plans to reward you for living in a time when you're susceptible and vulnerable to those kinds of things. Kind of like how the military pays soldiers more money if they're deployed in combat areas. They call it combat pay because they're, they're, they're vulnerable to injury. But if that's the kind of thing Paul's talking to Timothy about, how come he went on in verse 12 in 2 Timothy 2 to say, if we suffer, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. Paul says if we deny him our suffering, he'll deny us the chance to reign with him. <laughs> but how can we do that? How can we deny suffering things like aches and pains and afflictions and diseases? We all got to suffer those things whether we deny them or not. 
But here's the thing about that. We don't fully suffer them with Christ unless we suffer them like he suffered them. When you grumble and complain about your pain and suffering, you're not suffering them like the Lord did. So in that measure, you're not suffering them with Christ. And in that measure, you won't get to reign with Christ at the level you could have reigned with him. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by all this, Paul puts it another way in your next reference in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. He says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of what? A glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Those verses say that our afflictions are working glory for us. The glory of reigning with Christ. Just as Paul's talking about here. But they're only doing that while we look not at the things which are seen. And the things which are seen are your afflictions. If you're looking at your afflictions, you're probably going to be griping about them. I know I do. And they'll work against you. And not for you when the Lord's handing out rewards. And they'll cause you to suffer a loss of glory at the judgment seat of Christ. And you won't be ruling over the angels at the level you could have been. And I have to tell you, as I tell you that, I, I can hear Dave Stewart's voice in my head saying what he said about all this. <clears throat> he said, hey, we all have to suffer those things. Why not make them count for something by suffering them like the Lord did? Why not grumbling and complaining about them? And to illustrate what he meant, he used the example of what Paul said about himself in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17. Woe is unto me if I preach not for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. <clears throat> but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. The dispensing of the gospel of the grace of God was committed to Paul, so he had to do it. But he said, if he did it willingly, he knew God would reward him with glory for it. So why not do it willingly? He had to do it one way or the other. And you have to suffer headaches and whatever you've got in life. Why not do it like the Lord did? So he can reward you. Suffering without griping about it is the strongest testimony you can give to unbelievers without opening your mouth. And it is the best example you can give to believers to build them up in the faith. No wonder the Lord's going to reward you for it. And it is the reason he allows you to suffer so you can share in more of Christ's glory. And to give you some incentive to do that, Paul goes on in verse 18 of our text to say, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us.
Now I got a question for you. How'd Paul know that? <laughs> How did he know that was true? How did he know that the things we suffer can't compare with the glory that awaits us in heaven? Well, the answer is he was able to make that comparison himself thanks to something that happened to himself in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 all the way through chapter 12 and verse 4. In chapter 11, he, I'll give you an abbreviated version. He gives you a long list of the things he suffered. Of the Jews, five times received I, 40 stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten, once was I stoned, and then after that long list, he ends the chapter by saying, In Damascus, the governor kept the city with a garrison, desiring to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. And a few verses later, he says, I was caught up into paradise. Do you see the contrast he's drawn there? I was let down from the wall to escape, and then I was caught up. After talking about a ton of things that he suffered, including being let down in a basket, he was caught up to paradise, to the third heaven, that passage says, where he was able to compare the things he suffered on earth with the glory that was awaiting him in heaven. And he decided then and there that there was simply no comparison. So, what did he see up there? <laughs> what did he see in heaven that made him draw that conclusion? Well, he saw the glory of something he described in Ephesians 1, 17 to 23 where he said, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, the angelic host, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. When Paul was caught up to the third heaven, he saw how far above the angelic host that God had set Christ because of the things he suffered. And he knew that someday he'd be exalted that highly with Christ. Because God exalted him, it says, to the church. In other words, for our benefit. We're all going to be exalted that highly in Christ. And none of the things that Paul suffered could compare with that glory. For obvious reasons. But also because everything he suffered was temporary. And the glory he saw there was eternal. So I don't care how much you have to suffer in life. It's light compared to the eternal weight of glory that's waiting you in heaven. In that day, the Christian who suffered least with Christ is going to be glorified far above the angels with him. That's why verse 18 of our text says that that glory will be revealed in us. It was revealed to Paul when he was caught up to the third heaven, but it'll be revealed in us when we join the Lord far above the angelic host. And you know, as much as you're looking forward to that day, it might surprise you to learn that Christians aren't the only ones who are looking forward to it. Paul says in verse 19, of our text. For the earnest expectation 
of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, a creature is something that God created that has life, like you see in your next reference, Genesis 1, 21 and 24. God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, winged fowls move, the living creature after his con cattle, they move, beast of the earth after his, they all move. Now, God also created things like plants and trees. They have life. They're living, but they don't move around because they've got roots. <laughs> so a creature in the Bible is an animal creature. And that means that Paul is saying here in verse 19 that the animal world is earnestly and that word means eagerly expecting the manifestation of the sons of God and waiting for it. Now, before we talk about what the manifestation of the sons of God is, I have to point out here that your dog or your cat are not consciously waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Paul uses, the, uh, I'm sorry, he's using the same kind of poetic language that the psalmist uses in Psalm 145, verses 15 and 16, where the psalmist prayed, The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat, their food, in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living creature. God created food that every living thing eats. But the eyes of the animals are not consciously looking to him for it and waiting on him for it like that verse says. The eyes of your cat Copernicus, those eyes look to you for their food. And so do the eyes of your dog Winnie the Pooch. Now the eyes of men should look to God for food and they should thank Him for creating it when they eat their food. But the eyes of animals, they're only looking to you for their food. They're only looking to God, according to that verse, in a poetic sense. And animals, according to our passage here, are also waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God in a poetic sense. And the sons of God in this context are you and I, members of the body of Christ. We saw that in our message last Sunday in the context. We saw that we're already the sons of God, but it's not yet manifest that we are. You don't look any different to your neighbor than anybody else. The dictionary says that word manifest means to make something visible. And that's how it's used in 1 John 1, 2. We're speaking about the Lord. It says the life was manifested. And we have seen it. That's talking about Christ. He was alive before he came here to the earth, folks. But his life was manifested after he was born in Bethlehem. And you and I are already the sons of God. But we're not going to be manifested as God's sons until the rapture. When you're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, it'll be manifest to everybody in all of creation that you're a son of God. But now we've got to ask, well, 
why would the animal world be looking forward to that? I mean, if you know your Bible, you know that animals are going to continue to suffer pain and of diseases and afflictions after the rapture. They're not going to stop suffering pain and afflictions and dying until God makes new heavens and a new earth. But here's the thing. The rapture will signal the beginning of the end of their suffering because after that God's prophetic clock will begin to tick again. And it'll only be a matter of time before the sons of God are manifest in Israel as well as in the body of Christ. And the suffering of animals will end in the new earth. And the reason that animals are so eager for this is that it wasn't their fault that they were made subject to pain and suffering. It was Adam's fault. As Paul goes on to say in verse 20 in your Bible. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Now that word vanity there, the dictionary says, it means emptiness. And in this context, it's talking about the kind of emptiness that Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes 3.19 where he wrote, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. So that a man hath no preeminence of a beast for all is what? Vanity. Ban it's talking about the vanity of death. First it's talking about the emptiness in, in unsaved men that comes from knowing they're going to die someday. If you're not saved this morning, you're watching this or you're here this morning, there's an emptiness inside because you know that someday you're going to die and leave behind everything that you cherish in life, everything that makes your life full. And that's the vanity that verse 20 is talking about here, that the animal world was made subject to when Adam sinned. The vanity of death. Death is what all pain and suffering leads to, folks. And Adam's sin introduced it to the animal world just like his sin introduced death to the world of people. If Adam hadn't sinned, no people would have had to die and no animals would have had to die. And verse 20 says that animals weren't made subject to that vanity willingly. Nobody asked them if they wanted to live lives full of pain and then die. They were made subject to the vanity of death by reason of him that subjected them to it. And that's not talking about Adam. Adam might have been the one that caused it, but he couldn't have done what that verse says. He didn't make animals subject to death in hope, as it says in verse 20 there. God subjected the animals to death in the hope that someday they'd be delivered from suffering and death. Now again, they don't hope for it consciously. But it's their hope as well as ours. So now we have to ask why Paul is talking about how animals were not made subject to death willingly. And the answer is there's a lot of people who ask why they had to be made subject to the vanity of death. Nobody asked them if they wanted to live a life of pain and suffering and then have to die. And when you tell them everything we've learned so far in Romans, that it's because of Adam's sin, they don't 
don't think that's fair. They weren't subjected to the vanity of death willingly. And that's, that's when you need to explain that God subjected them to death in hope, as it says in verse 20 there. In the hope of resurrection for believers. And in the hope that suffering will make unbelievers like them want to get saved. And go to heaven where there will be no more suffering. God subjected animals to death in the sure hope that someday he'd rescue them from death. Because they were the innocent victims of men. But he offers that same sure hope to people. And verse 21 says that God subjected the animals to death because, as it says in verse 21, your next verse, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And that word corruption in this context means the corruption of death that bodies go through in the grave. Again, death is what all pain and suffering leads to. And the animal world is going to be delivered from the bondage of the corruption of death into something that Paul calls the glorious liberty of the children of God. And he means the liberty that you and I will have from pain and suffering and death at the rapture. Every child of God is going to experience that liberty at the rapture and every animal will experience it in the new earth. That's their hope. And our liberty from pain and suffering is going to be a glorious one. Now, now don't get me wrong. It was glorious when the Lord was here on earth healing people of their pain and suffering. But let me tell you, that was just a taste of the liberty that's yet to come for all of God's people. Because when the Lord healed a man, he didn't heal his heart disease at the same time. He didn't lower his cholesterol. It was a piecemeal kind of healing that pales in comparison with the glorious liberty from pain and suffering that awaits you when God fixes everything that's wrong with you. But animals, animals weren't the only victims of Adam's sin. Paul says in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And that word creation in the Bible, that always refers to the world and everything in it, not just the animals. Look at Mark 13, 19. The Lord said, For in those days shall be... He's talking about the tribulation shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time. And that's not just talking about the animals that God created there, the creatures. That's talking about the mountains and the oceans and the rivers. So here, animals, animals aren't the only ones groaning in pain. The earth itself is hurting because of Adam's sin. Isn't that what we learned in Genesis 3, 17 and 18? After Adam's sin, God said, Because thou hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. The ground of the earth was innocent of any wrongdoing. <laughs> it wasn't made subject 
to pain and the vanity of death willingly. It too was cursed for Adam's sin. For Adam's sake. But listen. The whole creation is going to be redeemed for the sake of the one the Bible calls the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. But now I got a question for you. Do the ground and plants and trees that grow in the ground, do they feel pain and groan about it like it says in verse 22? We know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Well, according to the internet, which as we all know is never wrong, trees emit an ultrasonic sound when they're thirsty or suffer other kinds of distress. And I don't know about you, but I don't know if that's true or not. I just know this. I never want to hear them griping about it like they griped to Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I got to tell you, when she picked the apple off of that apple tree, and it said, I was glad that if somebody came along and picked something off of you, it totally creeped me out. <laughs> to this day, I don't know why they make little kids, when I was a kid, they made, oh, it's going to be on this year. You know, in those days you had to wait to see it once a year. Why they made a, I was terrified. <laughs> Go home and watch, Google that, get, get down YouTube, get the clip of that like I did. <laughs> and I don't mean to creep you out, but Luke 19, 37 to 40 says, the disciples began saying, Blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Palm Sunday. And some of the Pharisees said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. They were treating him like he was the Messiah. And some of the Pharisees didn't like that. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that. If these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Evidently, stones can talk. And not only that. The prophet Habakkuk said in Habakkuk 2.11, The stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Well, now we got sticks and stones talking with each other and having a little conversation in the new earth. And maybe appearing on Jeopardy, you know. <laughs> And if stones and trees can talk, maybe they can be waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Look what the prophet Isaiah said about that in Isaiah 42, 4 and 10, where he wrote, the, the islands, the isles, shall wait for his law. You say, well, no, it's talking about the people in the island. No! The isles shall wait for his law, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. The islands themselves, according to that, are waiting poetically for the Lord's coming and the new earth that he'll bring in the new earth. They know it's coming in the new earth because Isaiah, look what Isaiah says in 51, 5 to 16. The isles shall wait upon me Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like a smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and then what? Then he's going to make a new earth. He says, I'm going to let it pass away like a garment, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the new earth. And if islands are mindful enough to be waiting for the Lord's coming. Maybe islands and rocks and trees can do what verse 22 is saying. Feel pain. The internet says they, trees emit that ultrasonic sound when you start cutting them down too. 
We know that trees will someday be able to feel emotion. Because it says in Psalm 96, 12, and 13, Then shall all the trees of the world rejoice, for he cometh to judge it. Well, joy is an emotion. And if trees can feel the emotion of joy, I think maybe they might groan a little when they get hit by lightning. I know I would. <laughs> You say, well, all this is, is just more poetic language. Well, that's not the sense I got when, when the Lord said the stones would cry out. Is that the sense you got? I think he meant they would, literally. And if I'm right, then trees aren't the only things that'll, that'll be able to feel emotion in the new earth because it says in Psalm 98, 7 to 9, let the sea roar and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein let the floods of the oceans and seas clap their hands and let the hills be joyful together because he cometh to judge the earth and get the new earth started folks that verse says when the Lord comes the sea will roar its approval and clap its wavy hands. And hills are going to rejoice in emotion. And listen, waves and stones and trees, they all would have done that the first time the Lord came if the disciples hadn't cried out his praises on that first Palm Sunday. But now just imagine the welcome <laughs> that the Lord is going to get when he returns and everything on the planet sings out a hello to him. Now, in closing, I should add one more thing. You don't have to feel guilty about all the times that you skipped rocks across the water and they landed in the bottom of the lake. Or that your house is made up of timbers that may or may not start talking in the middle of the night someday. Tell you how loudly you snore. At least they might be thinking that now, even if they're not talking. You don't have to feel guilty about having trees cut down to build you a house because what did we read in Genesis? God gave man dominion over the whole earth. And that includes the rocks and the trees. And whatever you want to do with them is fine with God and it's fine with them. And you know what? Something else Dave taught me. That they're still going to be yours when you reign with Christ. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22, all things are yours whether the world or life or death or things present or things to come all are your and how's that work as dispensationalists we know we're going to be in heaven and Israel's going to be ruling over the earth but here's how it works you're going to rule over the angels far above and angels rule over Israel and Israel rules over the world so everything in the world is part of your inheritance for suffering with the Lord. Don't forget, 1 Corinthians 3, where that last reference is found, that's the chapter that talks about our rewards for serving the Lord. And he says, the world is yours. And... Very few things serve the Lord, like learning to suffer pain and distresses and afflictions like the Lord did, with patience. And he's going to talk about that next Sunday. Father, we, we thank you that we have such a great God who reveals Things like this that just boggle the imagination, but we know they're true. Because our spirit 
bears witness with the words that your spirit wrote in this book. Give us the, give us the, the acceptance of these things that we need to have to know that we'll have, we have a glorious future ahead of us. And we pray it in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Bless be.